My name is Jessica, and I will be your conference operator today. At this time, I'd like to welcome everyone to the Cruise Roll Quality Parameters and Tips on Keeping the Patients on the Therapy Part 3 of 3 conference call. All have been placed on mute to prevent any background noise. After speaker's remarks, there will be a question and answer session. If you would ask a question during this time, simply press star, then the number 1 on your telephone keypad. If you would like to withdraw your question, press the pound key. Thank you. My name is Renault. You may begin your conference. Thank Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the latest session of the DaVita PD webinar series. This covers the key clinical elements of managing patients on PD and is recommended for all DaVita nurses, medical directors, as well as any physician who has or plans to put patients on PD. Today's audience is a mix of physicians and DaVita teammates, and we're happy to see that there's such growing interest around the therapy. For those who are in attendance, you are eligible to receive one continuing education credit for today's presentation, as well as one credit for each of the four previous webinars in the current series. And all of our webinar sessions are recorded and available for on-demand access on this website. I often reference previous webinars in our current webinars, so please feel free to go back and watch the past webinars so that you can have a reference to what we're talking about. Will also include a Q&A session at the end. You can ask questions in multiple ways. You wait until the end of the presentation and ask your questions in person, or you can type them into the chat box of your webinar panel and we'll ask them for you. This is Cruise Control, Quality Parameters and Tips for Keeping Patients on the Therapy. It is part three of three of our mini series within an eight webinar series that we're having this year. And this covers the period of therapy greater than one year. Now, I'll pass the mic on to Dr. John Moran, who's going to introduce today's speaker. John? Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to introduce Dr. Sadler, who has an exotic background, as you all hear. He's currently a nephrologist with Durango Nephrology Associates in Colorado, but grew up in Zimbabwe and graduated from the University of Zimbabwe Medical School. He, however, did his nephrology and hypertension fellowship at the University of Medicine. He's also been an assistant professor at the University of New Mexico Hospital and Albuquerque Veterans Administration Hospital, member of the American Society of Nephrology and the Renal Physicians Association. He's been in private practice for more than 15 years and is currently, most importantly, the group medical director for the Galaxy team at the Vita. Dr. Adler? Take it away, please. Hey everybody, or good morning, depending where you are. Thank you, Maela, and thank you, John, for that introduction. Today we're going to uh, complete part three, a uh, three-part series involving keeping patients on uh, PD. And uh, my, my pleasure is to talk to you about the uh, time period of greater than one year and keep people on PD as they become uh, longer-term PD patients. So I'm going to start by recapping the two excellent previous presentations, which hopefully many of you have heard. First, from Raj Marotra, who taught about the, uh, the first six months on PD. Um, and he addressed the concept that um, there are, there are, it is unfortunately a frequent occurrence for patients to fail early. Um, that a substantial proportion of people who are going to fail do so early on. Uh, when talking about reasons for uh, transfer off PD early on, uh, things that are uh, perhaps that characterize that early period are catheter problems. Uh, you see uh, they are uh, predominant um, in uh, patients early on PD. And social issues, so perhaps patients starting out on PD uh, realize early on uh, the uh, significance of the task they have taken on and uh, that can be a cause of failures. Uh, John Murray followed up by uh, talking about the 6 to 12 month time frame. Uh, and in another excellent presentation, he talked about the fact that this time when the honeymoon is over, clinically uh, patients are often feeling well uh, and have to be persuaded to continue therapy, not necessarily uh, remembering the early improvement in their clinic status and their well-being that they may have experienced initially. 
it can it can also be a time when bad habits can develop. So if they unfortunately um, had a break in technique or a, a failure in their meticulousness during that time, they may have gotten away with it and may have uh, vertently or incorrectly um, um, uh, learned that they may be able to get away with it. This can, of course, lead to problems occurring during that period. They may also be entering a period where their residual renal function will be declining, and that's a topic we're going to talk about uh, during the talk today. We reviewed um, important issues related to dialysis prescriptions. On the other hand, uh, is the PD prescription adequate? Uh, in particular, has re residual renal function decreased? so that dialysis is necessary, perhaps requiring increased volumes um, with PD exchanges, actually requiring a, a daytime fill to maintain adequacy, and can the PD prescription be simplified? Can the baby get away with fewer exchanges, perhaps leading to less burnout? As a midday exchange always necessary, and he presented uh, very useful data regarding the fact that uh, for many patients, it's not a necessity. We'll be on these issues again. So an introduction, let's talk about the time period greater than a year on PD. I probably don't need to talk at much length about the importance of staying on PD with the audience um, on the call today. This is data from USRDS. On the left, shows survival of the modality of renal replacement therapy. And the gray colored line at the top on the left graph shows survival with transplant. Other dialysis modalities are shown in the remainder of the curves. And what's striking is that they're essentially superimposed on each other. The graph deals with survival by end-stage renal diagnosis uh, uh, three times weekly dialysis, uh, and the right-hand graph shows survival on peritoneal dialysis uh, by end-stage renal disease diagnosis. Uh, the point of presenting this data is that, that the lines essentially are the same, uh, for the most part better in on peritoneal dialysis. For the, the the benefits that patients see with regard to to um, um, quality of life uh, is by no means an inferior uh, technique, at least as good uh, or better than hemodialysis. Um, so that's why we want to keep people on the on the uh, the technique. This from Peritoneal Dialysis International has actually been used by both previous presenters, looking at um, reasons for dropout from P based the time on dialysis. And um, uh, as you can see, the, uh, the, the purple bar in the middle, which is transplant, uh, I'm happy to report that the longer you're on dialysis, the more likely you are to get a transplant. That's the good news. Uh, other reasons for dropout, to uh, great extent, are the same. You can see that we still lose patients to uh, infectious problems to see in the salmon pink towards the top, under dialysis and ultrafiltration failure emerging as, as reasons for dropout from PD. Um, uh, what is less um, uh, of an issue um, is um, um, problems with abdominal complications and catheter complications. So, <clears throat> list of things that I think are the good news for the time period greater than 12 months. Um, first, patient and their family are becoming better informed about PD and about how to deal with complications. It's important to remember that the dialysis unit, of course, is a little mini community of its own. And uh, we have certainly uh, seen uh, a lot of uh, well-tenured uh, or longer-term PD patients start to take on uh, a role model um, role uh, for other PD patients. They're saying to encourage patients to move on to the treatment. This can be motivating for people. 
uh, can benefit uh, both the long-tenured and the shorter-tenured uh, PD patient. They may also be working up for a transplant, and this can be a strong motivating factor that can help with compliance. And they um, have learned in a positive uh, manner from mistakes in the past. So if they had, for example, peritonitis or problems with ultrafiltration, uh, we hope that these lessons have taught um, a, a, a positive lesson in terms of how to prevent them in the future. And hopefully they're also entering a period where medical regimens have stabilized. Now they may know better how to prevent and treat um, constipation and uh, fluid overload and so on. The bad news that we start to see after 12 months are firstly that burnout may be kicking in and may be worsening. We'll deal with that in a second. Residual function may well be worsening and the inadequacy of um, clearance. And also uh, that patients and their family may be starting to become more complacent to take shortcuts and learn in a, uh, a negative fashion uh, from previous um, problems that they have had. So let's burn out for a second. To reiterate something that John had said previously, it's a good time to review the dialysis prescription. Are we reasonable things of our patients? Is there a way sometimes to cut back on the prescription and in particular to look at whether a midday exchange is still necessary? It brings also that we're there to take care of the whole patient. The patients who are fatigued by sleep apnea, for example, or by cardiac disease are at risk of burnout because they have so many other symptoms going on that they need to deal with. And how to deal with these issues can sometimes go a long way to resolving the burnout problem. Um, previous mentor, uh, Fred Finkelstein, has published extensively depression in end-stage renal disease and is really extremely common. And depression, which may be treatable either through counseling or through medical therapy, uh, is a potentially treatable cause. Uh, that uh, of burnout that that can sometimes do quite well with with uh, as I said with treatment and finally, uh, to help with burnout it's all to remember that there are other resources out there that can be of great help have the family uh, appropriately to give support to the patient are we in the clinic uh, and dealing with family issues as well as the patient issues there are many resources out in the community. Home health uh, nursing, for example, can help sometimes with other medical issues and the amount of fatigue related to the PD. Uh, and then remember that DeVita has many uh, resources available. Use your social worker, for example, to deal with social issues at home that may be contributing to burnout. Or rolling in DeVita RX. Um, can help reduce uh, the need for visits to the pharmacy and, and can help a great deal with um, the amount of effort needed by the patient. So I'm going to move on to, um, and I'm just noticing what a terrible grainy picture this is, I'm going to move on to some myths uh, about things that tend to stop people uh, staying on PD. So things that really don't affect the long-term survival of PD technique. And the first educational level. So this this uh, study done by the uh, the Brazilian PD group uh, because of confirms what I think about higher education. And this is a long-term follow-up of patients in Brazil, their survival, both the patient and technique survival for PD patients uh, together as a cumulative survival. Patients with varying degrees of education. As you can see, the patients with, with a college education really fit no better than those who were actually illiterate. Uh, and, um, you know, different levels of education were, uh, were, are all shown there. The purple one at the bottom is college education. The level of education doesn't mean that you're going to be able to stay on PD and may, in fact, mean the reverse. Previous surgery. Study 2007 
uh, by Chen looked at patients with uh, versus those without previous abdominal surgery for two years. And there was no difference either in PD failure, so withdrawal from PD, nor in peritonitis rates in patients with and without previous abdominal surgery. They did point that uh, laparoscopic PD catheter placement was advisable. It was used in all of the patients in the study and is re uh, largely becoming uh, the uh, standard of care in many uh, PD programs for PD catheter placement. Previous transplant. So in C. Jason, uh, this study looked at patients who had a failed transplant and had to return to dialysis or begin dialysis anew. Uh, as you can see from the superimposed lines, uh, dialysis and PD uh, were identical in terms of survival of the patients. Uh, so modality choice uh, is, is not a problem. Uh, previous transplant does not prevent uh, long-term success of peritoneal dialysis. You may, uh, some uh, practitioners say that patients can't do PD because uh, they have autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease. Uh, and that's in fact not the case at all. Uh, the, the theory there is that the abdomen's too full to be able to do PD effectively. Um, this was uh, uh, disproved um, in a study last year. This would be a follow-up study of PD patients. Uh, four of them had polycystic kidney disease or had other um, uh, ESD diagnoses. The survival, patient survival was identical between the two groups. The peak survival was actually better for those patients who had polycystic kidney disease. And pertus rates were identical. There are more um, abdominal wall hernia in the uh, PKD patients, and, uh, and this has again been covered in some of the uh, presentations previously, uh, a less aggressive approach to treating abdominal hernias uh, has largely become the rule, and all these patients were able to resume PD after their abdominal wall hernias were repaired. So let's talk a bit about uh, residual renal function. Patients are on PD for longer, there is a tendency to lose uh, residual renal function in many but not all patients. I want to talk for a while about the EAPOS study, the European APD outcome study. This is a lot of useful information from this study. It was observational, so it was not a randomized trial. It was done in patients, all of whom were on. Uh, AD. Um, the key was monitored by a central office. Uh, it was carried out in 13 countries and in 26 centers throughout Europe. And these were patients with a no residual renal function. All of them had creatinine, uh, an, a, um, an intrinsic creatinine clearance of less than 1 ml per minute uh, or essentially no urine output. A standard protocol for their APD. So even some patients who were empty during the day, uh, most had a day fill, such dicodextrin, uh, and others didn't. And these patients were followed out for two years. The two patient survival was 78%, technique survival 62%, and a combination of those two uh, gave a survival of 49%. Now, again, there was no um, control group in this trial. But they had their outcomes to um, other large uh, adequacy uh, studies, CANUSA and AMADEX. Essentially, that they had the same results, and though, of course, CANUSA and AMADEX had a mixture of patients both with and without residual renal function. So, EAPOS, the mortality was perhaps a little better. The NEEC survival was perhaps not quite as good. But overall, the results were very uh, comparable. The clearance goal, uh, um, so set a goal of 50 liters per week. They actually had some changes in this during the course of the study. When they set goal, they found it was achieved in 94% of their patients. They set arbitrary ultrafiltration goal of 750 mLs per day. Uh, they have 
have a failure rate uh, that was substantial, 24% of this failed to reach the ultrafiltration goal. However, uh, all of those patients had clinical uh, symptoms related to ultrafiltration problems or to fluid overload. That their predictors of mortality were comorbidities, particularly diabetes, pornogen, and the ultrafiltration volume that we've discussed. Um, again, uh, it's worth stressing that the study did not compare patients with and without residual renal function. And so none of the patients in the study had residual renal function. And the patients were on um, APD. So it was not a, a comparison of um, cyclo-assisted treatment with APD. So message from that study. He demonstrated that for many patients, once in your on PD remains an excellent treatment option. And that take home uh, that, I'd, that I'd like to make sure everybody gets is that you don't have to have residual renal function to PD well. On the other hand, residual renal function is still important and valuable. So from Canusa now, going back to 96, shows, uh, this is a graph showing survival of patients in Canusa depending on the level of total creatinine clearance. You can see the more clearance you have, the better survival. We didn't put any nice, uh, pretty graphs to, to show this, but the main benefit of this increase in clearance was associated with intrinsic GFR. Uh, notably, each 5 ml per minute was associated with a 12% decrease in the risk of death. That association was not found between the peritoneal clearance and mortality. So, integral function is a predictor of better survival. And um, while this is true with Canusa uh, and with PD, it is also, of course, the case in heat dialysis as well. So, it's important. What are the what are the issues important that we should look at in terms of preserving residual renal function? mentioning that, that renal function is better preserved uh, in peritoneal dialysis patients than hemodialysis patients. And there have been uh, a few studies looking at this. Um, the study by in 2000 uh, shows very convincingly significant uh, um, improved outcome with regard to residual renal function for PD. There have been several trials out there looking at different PD modalities, and so there's a difference in uh, preservation of residual renal function between uh, APD versus CAPD. Uh, to summarize those, I, I, I'm going to just say that there's, there's essentially no difference. So there's no good reason to choose one P modality or another based on preservation of residual renal function. I want to make the point that, that while worsening of residual renal function is common, it is not inevitable. And even patients who have been on uh, PD for several years may still have residual renal function. Why is it important? Because we want to do the best we can to preserve it. We, we've shown that it, that it uh, enhances survival. Well, what can we do to help preserve it? Well, with regard to medications, uh, uh, essentially do not help preserve residual renal function. They can be really useful for uh, maintaining volume removal. Uh, can help prevent um, 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 volume retention, sometimes in PD patients, in those who have some residual function. They do preserve urine volume, even in patients um, who are receiving dialysis. But they're not associated with any improvement in residual renal function. With regard to glycosides, this is important controversy. But of course, uh, these are useful drugs uh, sometimes in treatment of peritonitis. Um, there are at least two trials out there, and there may be more, looking at the difference in decline of residual renal function in patients treated for peritonitis with a glycoside containing regimen versus cephalosporin-based uh, regimens. 
Uh, so no difference uh, in the residual renal function, at least for patients treated with the um, somewhat limited, perhaps two-week-long uh, treatment with amino glycosides for peritonitis. So that's somewhat assuring uh, for us uh, when we need to treat peritonitis. Although there is a plethora of literature regarding iodinated contrast agents and their effects on renal function, there are not, to my knowledge anyway, any stalking at their effect on residual renal function. I would say that I think it's reasonable to try to limit their use um, in patients on dialysis. Now, we always avoid them, and uh, patients, of course, do need to get them from time to time. Um, as far as possible, I try to avoid them. I try to limit the dose of contrast. And my opinion is that treatment uh, possible uh, with fluid uh, for those patients that, that aren't subject to fluid overload can help to prevent uh, contrast nephropathy. For anti-inflammatory drugs, again, I think most of us would try to avoid using them uh, in patients with end-stage renal disease anyway. Uh, they may contribute to loss of residual renal function. There's not a lot of data out there. Looking at potentially beneficial drugs, so good data that both ACE inhibitors and ARB are effective in preserving renal function. Um, this is true for both uh, Ramipril and ACE inhibitor. Um, a study in uh, uh, Annals of Internal Medicine 2003 showed a small but significant difference in preserved residual renal function for patients randomized to Ramipril versus no Ramipril. And although the difference there looks very modest, 2 mLs per minute per year versus 3 mLs per minute per year. Remember that these, this is in patients who may only have uh, 5 to 8, maybe 10 mLs per minute per year of clearance anyway. So, it, fortunately, this is actually quite a significant uh, difference. Um, similar to for angiotensin receptor blockers, uh, a trial with Valsartan in 2004 showed a numerically similar amount of benefit uh, to preservation of residual renal function. Um, and there, are, there are other trials with both ACE and ARBs out there showing similar data. There's additional data suggesting that calcium channel blockers uh, also help preserve residual renal function. Of course, that controls blood pressure uh, may help uh, preserve renal function anyway. KDOE recommendations, which will, I suppose, soon be KDIGO recommendations, are treat uh, patients with end-stage renal disease and with residual renal function with ACE or ARB to help preserve residual renal fun function. Other things to determine the rate of loss of residual renal function are perhaps the things you might expect, heart proteinuria, the presence or absence of diabetes, age, high body mass index, and hypertension. Worth mentioning uh, and thinking about because, of course, that's more modifiable, so keep pressure under control, tightening control of diabetes and heart disease um, can preserve residual renal function in addition to the other benefits they may bring for the patient. So I'll end uh, my part of the presentation there and, and open up uh, to questions and comments. Um, it's been a privilege to share um, these uh, ideas and comments. Uh, on, on keeping patients on PD, um, and um, Maela, when you're there, will open up to the audience to get their ideas and, and questions and comments uh, whenever you're ready. Absolutely, and thank you, Dr. Sadler. Jessica, please prompt the question. At the time, I'd like to remind everyone, in order to ask a question, press star, then the number one on your telephone keypad. We'll pause just a moment to compile the Q&A roster. That's star 